right, well, today we're wrapping up dangerous prayers. And one of the things that uh, we've tried to weave into our DNA here at Connection is to be a pray first church. And so if you've been around the Connections table or maybe you've been around Connection folks, you might see one of these bracelets, Romans 12, 12, pray first. It just is there to kind of remind us that whenever we hit a challenge, whenever we're facing some sort of obstacle, uh, that we go to God first in prayer. Another thing that we uh, try to put out there too is our prayer calendar, which is kind of new this year, but uh, also our prayer posts or our prayer wall, which there's one located in the back of the room that you can go back and write your prayer requests and praises on and stick them there. You can go back there and pray for other people as well as they do that. Uh, but also even within the app, there's a prayer wall feature that you can go on. And uh, if you're involved in a small group ministry, obviously that's a great way to just enlist the prayer support of other people who are journeying through life with you. Uh, but let's be real, like life throws us challenges all the time. And as soon as we get through one challenge and feel like things are going smoothly, what happens? Another one comes along, right? We feel like, man, I, I've, I finally got momentum. I'm finally figuring this thing out. And then another wheel falls, right? And so we just try to figure out how to manage through that. And so really for me, about three years ago, I was facing one of those difficult times. So this church plant, uh, this fall celebrates seven years of ministry, which is really awesome, right? Seven years that uh, my family has been in the Columbus area and, uh, you expect like church growth whenever you're planting because, you know, I think most of us like just expect things to go well, <laughs> even though, you know, things are, aren't always going to go that way. And so like the trajectory, you're just expecting smooth sailing. But about three years ago, we had uh, some different people leave the church, people that were uh, near and dear to the heart of the ministry. And as much as you try not to take that personally because they have a savior, that's Jesus. It's not me. Like it's still pretty easy to take it personally. And so just going through a, a really difficult time with some of the stuff that was going on, and you would think as the pastor, like I would just have this embedded in me, pray first. And so when my wife would say something like, have you prayed about it? It's like, <sighs> you, you, you kind of hit those moments and maybe some of those moments have happened in your life. You lose a job and somebody says, have, have you prayed about it? <sighs> You're going through problems in your marriage. Well, have you prayed about it? Right? And just all of the things that life kind of throws at us, you know, that should be the number one focus. But it was really uh, an opportunity I had to, to teach at the Columbus Christian School that, that really, like, it smacked me right in the face at that moment in time. The topic was given to me is 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And so it's not like I went out and, and picked this, but it was there for me. And so I started digging in deeper. I don't have any idea if the kids got anything out of it. But for me, like, I got a ton out of that. And so the story is really this, like Judah, which was the southern kingdom, they were facing opposition. Somebody ran to the king, Jehoshaphat, and said, hey, the enemies, they're gathering together and they're coming, right? And so he, he was afraid, and that's what it says in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. He was afraid. Most of us would be. All the enemies at one time, they're converging against me. This is not good. Right? And sometimes our life feels a little bit like that. It feels like everything is coming at once. Right? There's financial problems and there's relationship problems. Maybe there's communication problems and work problems. And it's just like problem upon problem and let's just start a collection. Right? Because when it seems like, like everything is going wrong, then everything just continues to kind of go wrong. Matter of fact, if you're dealing with anxiety, we've got a new series coming up next week that talks about anxious for nothing. And I think that that would be a good one to, to maybe come back and plug into. But one of the keys to that is giving these, this stuff to God. And so Jehoshaphat, he was afraid. And then like, there is this powerful word that comes right after that. The word is simply and, A-N-D. And he gave it to God. And he gave it to God. When you're up against things that, that terrify you, is that your first response? Because I can tell you that my first response is to fix it, right? My first response is to roll up my sleeves and get to work. Maybe your first response is to stress about it, to complain about it, to worry about it. And then, then say, God, this is yours, and then reach in and take it back the next moment later and continue to worry about it. 
But in this moment, he gave it to God. And it's a really crazy story. Go back and read through it. So, so he prays. Then he encourages the whole nation to fast. Can you imagine what it would be like if, if one of our presidents, whoever it was, would stand up there and say, hey, guys, we're in trouble. We need to pray and fast and seek God's approval. Oh, heaven's open wide. Right? This happened for Jehoshaphat leading Judah. He, he sought God's approval. And then as the enemies were coming, he told his troops, go out there, man your battle stations, but don't do anything. Because God's got this. <laughs> what? And maybe you're wrestling through some of that same insecurity. Right? Maybe you've given it to God in prayer, but you really have a difficult time trusting that God's actually got it. And so we, we man our battle stations and, and things are starting to happen. And, and so instead of standing back where we're supposed to and just letting God do what God can do, we start to tinker with things. Do we have any tinkerers in the room? Mm, I'm guessing we got a whole room full of tinkerers. They just can't help but meddle in the stuff that we've already given to God. But, but this is what they do. They stand back, and it's almost like church broke out. Like they, they start praising God, and God does what only God can do, and the enemies that are coming against Judah start fighting each other, and they annihilate one another. Dummies. Right? But this is what it's like when God is brought into our battle. But so many times, guys, so many times, we don't actually trust that God is going to do that in our life. We go, how could God possibly fix this? How could God possibly use me? Does he realize how screwed up I am? Does he realize how messed up this situation is? Do you realize who he is? Do you realize what he's already done? Right? And so when we give it to God first, when we pray first, that's really saying, I need to let off control. I think there was a song about this a while back. I haven't listened to it except for when it's been forced upon me. Something about Jesus and a wheel. But give it to God and let God do what only God can do. So why pray? This is something that I've wrestled with. Why pray? Because God already knows everything. Maybe there's other people that have echoed those feelings as well. Well, God already knows everything. God's going to do what God's going to do. So why give it? Well, the simple answer is this, that God wants us to want to give it to Him. He wants a relationship with with us. That's what prayer is. And probably the only way that I can make this make sense in my life is if if one of my kids comes in and they want to share something with me, I may already know what it is that they're going to tell me. Good, bad, or otherwise. I may already know. But what I gain from that is that they actually wanted me to know. Parents, grandparents, how does that make you feel when the kids and grandkids trust you enough to invite you in can you imagine how god feels when you and i actually invite him in now i also want to throw in a couple of caveats because sometimes when we go to god all we do is complain how would you feel if your kids only came to you to complain my guess is you're glad that they want a relationship you just don't want that kind but you would also be offended if they had a problem and they didn't bring it to you. So it's kind of a little bit of both. right? It, it's so hard in today's society with three kids who are very tech savvy and they can Google anything. right? And it's if, if you just ask mom or dad, we would just tell you. You don't have to go to Google for everything. right? How many of your God problems are you Googling? instead of giving them to God. I'm guessing we're probably pretty guilty of that one as well. And so we struggle with this. And you know what? If we were always just, just telling God the good things, hey, everything is great, everything is... It's kind of like that, that person that you just greeted this morning that said, how you doing? And you're like, oh, it's great. Doesn't matter all the stuff that just happened to you on the way to church this morning, let alone yesterday, because everything is great. God, everything is great. Things are so amazing. Got this great church with this great pastor. You're welcome. Right? <laughs> but it's not always about the good stuff. Right? It's not, if, if your kids only brought to you the good stuff, 
that would also offend you. Because what you really want them to do is be real and to be honest and just invite you in. And so if you are with us and, and you've really struggled with praying, and you're like, how do I, how do I even do this? And I get so many times like, hey, you're the pastor, you pray. Like go to a family reunion. Hey, the, we have a resident pastor here. All right, you're praying today, right? That's the way it is because obviously nobody else knows how to have a conversation with God. But what I'm telling you is that we can all and we should all have conversations with God. And you're wondering what to say. Dude, just keep it real. Keep it real. We already talked about this. God already knows. You're dealing with something. It's stressing you out. Like you're so worried and consumed because God is going to know about the junk that you're hiding in your back closet. God already knows. Just be real. God, I am struggling with. I'm having a really difficult time with this. I can't handle this marriage, this relationship, this workplace anymore. And I just I need your help. God, I'm so glad that you brought this person into my life. Man, they've made a huge difference. Thank you. I was able to work a little overtime this week. And I was able to pay a few more bills. Right? Just be real. Be honest. Be open. Be transparent with God. He already knows. Right? So if you're, if you're wondering, like, can you say the wrong thing before God? No. No. Just talk to Him. Invite Him in. Now... I would also say that if you just ramble on and you want a relationship that really consists of not much of anything, it's just superficial, that's not what God is looking for. He wants you to open up and go a little deeper. If you're always wanting to complain, if you're always wanting to just bring the good stuff, right? the problem is we're not being real. And so I want to challenge you. The topic is dangerous prayers. And some of us, we're going to go deep here in just a moment. But every one of us should be challenged to pray. To give it to God instead of Google. Right? To trust Him with the things that He already cares about. And some of us, like we've trusted Him with our salvation. But we have difficult trusting Him with our problems. And we need to give it to God. So that's challenge number one. So... Dangerous prayers, week one, is search me. Like, search my heart, search my mind, search my my actions, search every part of me. Why? Because we don't always see our blind spots. And we need God to just point them out to us. And it's painful, right? None of us like it when somebody else points out our faults. We know enough of them, we don't want to know more. That's just the reality. Right, But there are certain people in our life that we need to trust enough to know that when they point out a fault, it's not just to point out a fault, it's actually to help us get better. And when we ask God to search me, it's trusting Him enough to say, help me get better. Help me realize where I'm not measuring up. Help me realize where I'm hurting people because I don't always see that. Sometimes we're just too consumed with us and we miss it. And then the second part of that is lead me, right? Search me, but but also lead me. You have control. You need to to usher the marching orders, which means you and I need to follow. And that's sometimes giving God the control, that Jesus wheel thing. It's a hard thing to do. And then last week we talked about break me. Gosh, talk about something that's really hard. Like like we just went from a pain scale on 1 to 10 of of like 6 to like 9.9. Break me. Break me. Help me to realize where I've built an incorrect frame of mind. Help me to realize where where everything that I'm doing is wrong, where you need to just actually remove all of the extra stuff and get down to the bare bones, get down to the foundation so that you can build the thing the way that you want it. Build my life the way that you want it. But sometimes that building doesn't just happen by coming in and doing a little remodel, throwing a little spackle on the wall. Right? But it actually means that you have to take some walls down. And those walls sometimes come at a cost. A financial cost. And sometimes they come at an emotional cost. And, and almost always they require a whole lot of hard work going into it. But do we trust God enough to say, hey, step in and just, just break me. And I th- don't think you can, you can pray that prayer 
without trusting God. Because too many times, too many times we've been broken and we've been hurt and we've been left with the residual effect of all of that pain. And we put up walls. Walls that that don't even allow people to come in, even God to come in and work on our lives because we simply don't trust. The trust has been broken. Boundaries are important, but walls need to come down. Right, boundaries help to keep us safe, help us to make wise decisions, but, but we need to allow God to come in. And so we let Him break your walls and let Him bring you down to your foundations and places in your life that you never thought you could go because you trust Him enough not to let you down and to build back better than what He's taken away. That's a huge question. Today, Today, the prayer is send me. Send me, well, it can be equally dangerous. It can be kind of scary. Why is it scary? Uh, For most of us that have been around the church, it's like, God, I do not want to go to Africa. Point blank, don't want to go. Don't know how to speak the language, don't know the culture, and quite frankly, I like indoor plumbing and air conditioning. Right? Please do not send me there. Right? And, and a lot of us, like our mind can immediately go to that. And sometimes this prayer means that you and I, we actually have to go someplace. Someplace maybe we've never been, that we never thought we could go. Sometimes praying this prayer means that you actually need to stay put right where you are. And for some of you, you're runners. And going is the easy part. And so when God says stay and deal with your stuff, that's, that's the hard part. Sometimes praying this prayer means that you have to leave a relationship. And those relationships, man, they can be hard to come by. But unless you're really willing to change who you're hanging with, it really is hard to change. So maybe God's calling you to leave a relationship. A friendship, a, somebody at work, a, a classmate at school. But maybe God's asking you to stay put in a relationship. Maybe that person who's hurt you needs to stay in your life so that you can love on them in the name of Christ, and that, quite frankly, sucks. It is hard to stay when you've been hurt. But maybe when you pray, God, send me, He's actually not sending you across the globe, but He's sending, sending you across the room. Maybe He's, he's sending you, you know, to, to a classmate. And sometimes the hardest conversations to have are the ones with people that are closest to us. That person working in the office just down the hallway. Or maybe that, that person that you, you work next to on the assembly line. A classmate at school. Man, that can be a hard place to go. Well, these three prayers come out of a book, uh, aside from the Bible, uh, a a book called Dangerous Prayers by Craig Rochelle. And he highlights in this chapter three kind of key examples of responses that sometimes we have that we can see in Scripture when God says, send me. So the first example comes from the life of Jonah. Jonah. So we went through the minor prophets this summer, those of you who were with us, and Jonah is actually a topic that's going to get hit this summer. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time diving into the story of Jonah other than to say this. God steps on the scene. He targets Jonah, who was a prophet of Israel. He's Jewish. And he says, I want you to go to Nineveh. What you may not know about Nineveh, it's the capital of Assyria. Assyria is not Jewish country. And the Jews had a really difficult time with anybody that wasn't Jewish because they're God's chosen people, so they are elite. Right? This is separatist faith completely. And so the idea of going to Assyria, to go to Nineveh, where all of this evil is festering up, Jonah's like, I want nothing to do with that. So when God says, send me, Jonah says, nope. He hops on a boat and he goes as far away from Nineveh as he can. The problem is he can't outrun God. 
right? So you fast forward the thing, a, a storm comes on, he gets thrown overboard, swallowed by a giant fish, spit upon the sea whenever he actually repents, and then God doesn't change his commission. He says, you still need to go. So Jonah does. He, he marches into the city, a huge city, gets to the center of it, broadcasts this message. I am a relational evangelist. I cannot imagine being a street evangelist and not having relationships with people when you're, you're sharing with them that the message of repent for the kingdom of God is near. But he walks in and, and he delivers a message very similar to that. And guess what? The people in Nineveh, including the king of Assyria, repent. He just walks in and shares a message. Every evangelist in history would love the kind of results that Jonah got. All he had to do was walk in, open his mouth, and people did what God wanted them to do. They repented. It didn't last very long, unfortunately, but they did repent. So the first response is this. When God says, send me, we say, nah, not having it. Maybe God's already been prompting you to go someplace, to, to just pick up and move and go someplace. And you're like, nah, can't do that. Can't go there, can't do that. I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. don't have enough money. But who's your God? And if God is going to call you to something, He's going to equip you to do what it is that He's called you to do. But it may not always be comfortable. And I think that's one of the things that we struggle with. We kind of like comfort, right? That's why we don't like to pray things like, search me. That's uncomfortable. Break me. Uncomfortable. Send me. No, thank you. Don't want to go there. But I still want to challenge you because sometimes God doesn't just call us across the globe. Sometimes he may call us to prison ministry, right? A, a place that is obviously full of broken people but it's hard, right? So what are you going to do to, to go there? Maybe God is going to call you to share His message of, great, of grace with somebody who has actually taken another person's life. They've committed murder. Can God actually forgive somebody who's taken someone else's life? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But we don't always want to forgive those kind of people. Especially if those kind of people have molested children. There's a special place in hell, right? But there's also a special place in heaven for those who repent and turn to God. Do we actually believe in the grace and the love of God for anybody? We have a God who can raise the dead, who can give us second chances, but, but are there certain people that for you are like the Assyrians and you want nothing to do with preaching grace to them because they might actually repent. I'm guessing some of those people live in your families. And for some of you, they're in your workplaces. And instead of being judgmental, we need to be grace-filled. Wow, that's a send me. That is a dangerous prayer. Maybe it's a, a bully at school. Gosh, and we know bullies just grow up to be bullies, right? We deal with them in the workplaces. But they need grace. And I always try to, to, to wrap myself in this frame of mind. I don't do it perfectly. Get me, I don't do that perfectly. But I don't know what somebody else has been going through up to this point. You walk in and you just rip me a new one. And I don't know, like, is your marriage falling apart? Is that the reason, like, you're so bitter right now? I don't know, like, are you just flat busted, broke, and you are down on your luck? I don't know if you're struggling with an addiction. I don't know if your parents beat you or if your parents just took off on you. But all I know is this, that you and I are all impacted by things that happen in our life. And some of them are within our control because we make some dumb mistakes. Some of them are our own stupid choices, but some of them are just thrown upon us. Do we take enough time to actually ask what's going on in somebody else's life? Because oftentimes we want them to extend us grace, but we're not always good extending it to other people. So, where is God prompting you to go? 
Are you just too busy? Too distracted? Is your answer still simply no? God, no. I love you. I know you love me. I know you've forgiven me, but I'm simply not going to go there. Right? That's one possible answer. Another possible answer is found in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 is the story of Moses. And what we know about Moses, like there's a huge amount. We could really dive into this one because it's way more than four chapters long. Right? But Moses, he was Jewish. He was, he was raised in, in the house of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, because the king of Egypt was killing all of the babies. And by God's province, he was saved. He was raised. He became an adult. He saw his own people who, who came down to Egypt to be enslaved. And it was a bad situation. And he felt horrible about the way that they were being treated. And so he actually killed somebody. Can God's grace save somebody who's taken a human life? Yeah. Right, and so Moses, he hears not, not shouts of victory from his people, but shouts of judgment. And so he takes off. Goes and does his own thing for a while. Kind of runs into this burning bush thing. It's burning but not consumed. And God is speaking from it. And God says, hey, i got a plan for you. And what's Moses say? Well, it basically boils down to there's got to be somebody better than me. But that's not the entire story. right? He is making excuses along the way. God, they're going to ask me who's sending me. What should I say? God says, Tell them I am. <laughs> That's a funny name. I am, right? But I am I, I'm before, I'm after, I'm during, I'm all things. I am sent you. Tell them. They'll believe. Well, they, they probably still aren't going to believe me. So how do I convince them? Well, you see your staff? Throw it down. Boom, snake. Ah! Pick it up by the tail. Boom, staff. Whoa, cool trick, bro. Cool trick, right? I want to know how to do that. Um. Yeah, what if they don't believe that one? Take your hand, stick it inside your coat, pull it back out. Oh, white leprosy, bad thing. You're excommunicated, buddy. See you later. Nope, stick it back in your coat, pull it back out. Hey, it's fine. Dude, this is awesome. That's not what Moses says. <laughs> He's like, yeah, they're not going to believe that either. Well, if they don't believe that one, then take a, a, a cup of water out of the Nile and just dump it on the ground. It's going to turn to blood. That's creepy. Right? And all of these things, like every time that, that Moses raises an objection, God has a response. I wonder how many times when God says, you need to go, that we go, ah, I'm just not smart enough. I don't know enough. I don't have enough. Like, they're really not going to believe me. All they're going to do is laugh and make fun of me. You know, this just isn't going to go well, God. No, I just, I just don't think there's got to be somebody better than me. I, besides, after all, I don't know how to speak eloquently. And God's like, who gave you your mouth, buddy? Like, let's have a serious heart to heart here. You're telling me no when I very well know the mouth that I gave you. And, and Moses is like, no, no I, I, just, I just can't. God is getting ticked. Right? There's, there's not that many places in Scripture you, where you see God just like just all out on somebody. Usually, God is providing opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity. And the Old Testament is full of that on God's people. Here's opportunity. Here's another. Here's another. Guys, you're, you're really kind of getting on my nerves. You're, you're really missing the point here. And I wonder how many times that you and I just simply come up with another excuse after another excuse after another excuse. Instead of simply trusting that God can do it. God gave you the mission, but He's also given you the resources and the provision to accomplish the mission. He wouldn't send you, right, if that wasn't the case. But there's another answer. Another example is found in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Page 571 in the Bibles we provide. It's the only one I'm really turning to because the other ones are like full stories. And this one doesn't dive into it so much. But what is there like we can definitely highlight and emphasize? And so Isaiah says, 
And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Who shall I send? The harvest is plentiful. Right, but the workers are few. Who shall I send? People are going to hell. People are hurting. People are suffering in their relationships, in their brokenness. Who shall I send? People need an eternity filled with grace and love. Who should I send? Then Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. And he said, go. And say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and bind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. I don't know if you've picked up on what, <laughs> what God is asking Isaiah to do. He's saying, I want you to go and proclaim the message, but people aren't going to listen. You go tell them, you go, go preach the message, you go tell everybody, but they are just going to have a hard heart and they're going to do their own thing. Wow. Is that the kind of place you want God to send you? Most of us, like it is as horrible as it would be to go to Nineveh and have people actually repent, like the absolute worst would be like, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to do God's thing and share God's message with God's people and they're going to love me. No, they're not. They're going to hate me. They're not going to listen to a word I say. And guys, that's the life of most of the prophets. <laughs> Go and share the good news with God's people, and they won't listen to any of it. And maybe that's what we're scared of. We're scared that people might actually reject us. But I seem to remember something about Jesus saying, if the world hates you, take heart. They hated me first. In this world, you will have problems. But take heart, I have overcome the world. But do we trust Him? Because send me is tough. Send me is hard. Send, send me is definitely not convenient and comfortable. But if you pray, send me, are you willing to follow? I mean, because every one of us has the ability to say, now, God, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to go there. Like, you can give me a list of, like, give me your top ten list, I'll choose one. But don't just tell me to go. It's kind of like, maybe you had a parent in your life that says, hey, when I say jump, you say, how high? When God says go, where? Not, not when, not how much is it going to cost me, not who's going to be there, but Where? Where can I go? Where do you want me to be? And so here's three difficult questions that I think we need to ponder. Do you trust God enough to lead you? Quite frankly, for most of us, the answer is no. I do not trust God. I want to be in control. Do you trust God enough to lead you? Do you trust God enough to provide for you? A lot of us, our anxieties can come down to not being able to take care of our own basic needs. So trusting God, that can be a scary place. Do you trust Him enough to provide? Do you trust Him enough to work through you? Yeah, I know you're broken. I am too. Right? You've made mistakes. I have too. You have doubts. I have them too. Right? But do you trust God enough to work through you? Even if you haven't gone to college, right? Even if you haven't got an education, even if you haven't been a believer that long, right? do you trust God to work through you? He has created everything about you. And we're all about making disciples at Connection. And one of the ways, like, like we just try to, to define this as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Fully devoted means you're all in. Heart, soul, mind, strength, you're all in to following Him. You are submitted to His will. That's hard because we want to be in control. We want to be in charge. And we're committed to his mission, which is to seek and save the lost, right? To connect people to Jesus Christ. But the only way that you and I are going to do this 
is that we die to ourself daily. And last I checked, dying to self isn't very comfortable either. <laughs> right? So it's a tough call. And maybe, maybe God has given it to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, this is kind of a, a different way of doing this, but I'm going to give you about a minute just to ask. And, and, and don't ask it if you don't mean it. Right? Just close your eyes and pretend. I mean, we're good at that. Right? Just close your eyes and pretend you're asking. But if you're, if you're really serious about it, though, I want you to ask that question. God, where do you want me to go? Maybe he wants you to stay. But maybe there's some place that he wants you to go. Maybe it's across the world, but maybe it's across the room. And do you trust him? Will you continue to pray for his wisdom and for his leading? Will you listen when he speaks to you? And will you be bold enough to follow? Father, we have a great opportunity to seek you first, to deny ourselves. But denying ourselves is not easy. We have a room full of people that are at all different places in their faith. Some of them, probably most of them, are struggling with this. Where, God? Can I possibly surrender? Can I, can I give up something? But we take, take faith in that we serve a God who stepped out of heaven and took on flesh and came to this world humble, dressed in the form of a man. And because we couldn't grasp how amazing you are without it. And then to take on punishment, persecution, and death, even death on a cross, your life was laid out before us. And so as we move into a time of communion, we remember we don't have to be perfect because we serve a God who is. We don't have to know everything because we serve a God who does. Help us to trust you and forgive us where we fail. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.